So we decided to call our session today, Welcome to the New Age of Glass, because you probably don't heard, but uh, this year, 2022, was actually declared by the United Nations as the International Year of Glass. And this is to underline the role of glasses in our society. Let's not uh, forget that if we have the technology today, it's because of glass. Uh, through the centuries, uh, glass has kept meeting on societies and uh, people's need. And um, I think glass material is unnoticed, and you will actually realize today that you have used glasses since this morning a lot of time uh, without noticing it. And I think it's time that we have this International Year of Glass. So before we start, so we are speaking in English, but the slides are in French, so at least you can uh, also uh, uh, read <laughs> in French. So before we start, um, uh, do you know what is a glass? Have you ever thought about what is a glass? So we had the discussion today with our son, and then it's, yeah, this is a glass, right? But do you have a definition of glass? So let's start with uh, all the matter that we are surrounded, they are formed by atoms, and the atoms connect together and create molecules, and the molecules connect together to create the matter. And in the glass, there is no arrangement in the long range, but there is a short range order. So this is what we call an amorphous material. So this is an example that we use uh, in uh, glass sciences, so typical. You have here the structure of a crystalline material. So this is the, the silica glass that we are going to speak about today. So it's a, 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 a silicon. So this is one atom surrounded by oxygen. And they are creating this uh, a pyramid. It's like the, the shape of the molecule. And they attach all together. They share all corners. And uh, in crystal, they are uh, well organized and, uh, you know, everybody has its own place. And all the crystal in the world, they, have ex they are exactly the same. This is the structure of a glass, the same as the, the silica, SiO2. As you can see, we have the same molecule, but they are arranged completely in disorder. The, all the, the free space, you have the small one, the very large one. And each glass is unique because they are amorphous. So here is an example. Like if you go to the movie theater, we have the seats. And it's well organized. Well, that could be a crystal. And this is a concert where we are dancing. And this is completely amorphous if you look at people. So this will be a glass. Uh, so as of today, so this is a brief definition of glass. But the definition is still not real defined and is still under debate. So Jonathan, what will be, how are you going to, to add uh, in this definition? So, okay, <coughs> if you look at the definition of glass, like even from, from a dictionary, the, it's always characterized by the brittleness. It's true, glass is brittle. It's also characterized by transparency, uh, which to some extent, well, it depends on who is looking at it. So when we speak about transparency, like Leticia said earlier, uh, we d you talk with someone in the street or you talk with my son, for instance, it, they will look at the glass like this one and say, okay, this is transparent. But let's not forget that transparency um, also depends on the wavelength that, that we are working on. So for example, if we work with different type of glass, they may not look transparent to your eyes, but they are still transparent in other wavelengths, so in the UV or um, in the infrared. Uh, so there is a need to kind of like expand a little bit the, the definition uh, in order to show basically the, the um, um, how do you say, the versatility of the glass and basically everything that we can do with the glass. So Ella, what can you say from the artist's point of view? Well, I think my point of view is a bit more traditional. I uh, use the type of glass that is transparent and can be brittle, but for me, um, it has so interesting qualities. Uh, it's easy to form when it's hot. It's soft and you can sculpt it easily. And uh, 
then transparency and the really vivid transparent colors are like a huge interest to me. All right. So um, this is an example of glass and it's a solid, right? But actually we call this a super liquid because the way we do the glass and we'll discuss about that, we have to melt and to get a liquid and then we freeze this liquid in the solid state. So this is when I said that there are still some debate about what is really a glass. So now you know that. So um, now let's continue and let's step back with the history of glass. So how, how old do you think glass is or glass science? Is that 10 years, uh, 50, 100, 1000 of years old? What do you think? So we know th it's exactly, it's extremely old. <coughs> the first glasses were actually, uh, the, the, the first glass we found, uh, we think it's about 2600 BC, so Mesopotamia. And it's actually extremely old. And uh, so here you have just a few examples about the, the key time point, uh, like the first uh, um, bowls and drawers. Uh, the first blown glasses, the first windows, but um, actually we, the, the, um, the science actually really started in the 18th, 19th century and with uh, the first theory of glass formation because before we took powder and then we make the glass but nobody actually knew exactly what it was and tried to actually make new glasses and this was really uh, from the um, the, the scientist so shot was one of them in the 18th and 19th and that was the beginning of glass science. So I, I will just continue with, <coughs> with saying like what makes basically glass such an amazing material? And it goes back to what I was just saying is the versatility. So um, Ella was discussing about like the more traditional type of glass, the silicate glass which is transparent. <coughs> but um, we can look at those glasses or the window glasses. But something that so often is forgotten is, if you look at the periodic table, so those are all the elements that you can find. And basically, if you look at research, every single element has been placed into a glass. So glass is one of the unique material where you can, you can actually introduce inside any of the elements of the periodic table. And I swear it's been done. So you can find radioactive glasses, you can find glasses uh, with like metal ions. That's, for example, what Ella is doing. So depending on the ions that you, you introduce into the glass, you can actually change the color. Uh, you can also change some of the properties. So if you think about glass as um, like a resistant material, if you take the window glass, it's an extremely resistant material, it's not going to degrade. If now we move to different, different composition, we reduce a little bit the silica, we increase some of the ions, we can also increase the uh, dissolution rate. So we can have like glasses that will actually degrade over time, which can be beneficial, for example, in medical uh, application. Now we can also make glass, like I said earlier, that will be transparent in the infrared. They're not traditional glasses, they're not silicates. They actually, they actually contain calcogen. So calcogen are uh, sulfur, selenium, arsenic, toxic glasses, <coughs> but that have like unique properties that Leticia will discuss a little bit later. And you can make glasses that will also be so resistant that they will actually encapsulate some of the radioactive elements. That's what glasses are uh, used nowadays to uh, um, treat some of, of the nuclear waste. Uh, so the beauty of glass is really the versatility and the ability to not only modify the composition to get glasses that will be extremely resistant, like all the fiber optics that we are using, to glasses that will completely dissolve, or glasses that will have like a wide range of optical properties which can go from a color, or color change as a function of some stimuli, or specifically transparent in some region of interest. So what I always say to uh, the student when they start glass science is like, making cake. How many types of different cake do we have? A thousand, right? We can put some almonds, nuts, glass is exactly the same. We have thousands of different compositions that we can make and we have not made all of them, so we still have a lot to do.
as I said earlier, class is um, versatile also in shaping. Um, in its hot state, it can be pressed into molds or blown. And in the picture, you can see kind of um, a bit of the versatility of the different shapes. So there's paperweight and vessels and lenses uh, and even optical fiber. So um, yeah, it's uh, both like handicraft methods and then industrial, there's kind of a great variety of shapes and that you can produce. All right, so let's continue. Uh, since this morning, when have you used glasses? I'm trying to think this morning since you woke up. <laughs> so the, the glasses, yes. Jonathan spoke about the windows. I don't have my cell phone with me. Yeah. And we have a slide about that, that we are so, all the screens. So actually, you have used glasses since this morning without noticing it. So we have uh, the windows. Uh, I'm not sure if some of you have this table uh, with uh, the, 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 the glass. Um, the um, um, to uh, encapsulate, so we have the, the bottoms. And um, I don't know if you notice, but depending on the liquid, then the bottle has different color. So the, the champagne, the red wine, the white wine, they don't have the same color bottle. And it's because we have to protect the liquid from the outside, so from the UV, for example. So we have to adapt the glass to the liquid that we have inside so that we protect the liquid. But it's the same for the medical application. So you don't want to have the glass going inside uh, the liquid uh, that you are going to inject in the body. So it's a specific glass container. And then, of course, we have the bottle for the perfumes the and then all the drawers for the food. Then, like uh, somebody, s as somebody said, we have the glasses, the bowls, the plates. Um, you probably use your uh, uh, your stove uh, oven, so the window of your oven and uh, the ceramic to cook. Uh, then uh, you probably uh, use your car or the bus or the train and then you had the windows and uh, your, uh, we should not forget that a lot of research has been done on the windshield so that when there is an accident that the, the, the glass will break with no sharp angle and this has saved a lot of lives. This is the tempered glass so that the, the glass was actually reheat uh, specifically to uh, break with no sharp angle so it doesn't uh, cut. And then, of course, uh, to transport information. So you have, so we spoke about the screen, uh, so for the, the, the computers and the cell phone, but also the fiber, so for the telecom, so we can actually transfer uh, to internet. And let's not forget art. So this is, I think, one of the best examples, this uh, pyramid in the, in the museum in Paris, the Louvre. Um, that was one of the most beautiful pieces from my point of view of class art. In brief, because um, I'm kind of presenting the finished class here. Um, so usually people, when I say finished class, they have a really strong connotation to design class and it is something that is very well connected to Finland, but I would say um, that maybe the highest point was after the war, 1950s, 1960s, uh, and we had like a handful of big scale factories, but when we come closer to this day, um, Itala is the only one still functioning. Um, so in the map, there's the red dot for Nuutajärvi and Humpila because they're quite close to each other. And then if you would go like a little bit to the northeast, there's Itala and then Tampere also. Um, 
But even though the factories have closed down, mainly because Finnish glass cannot compete with the global market, uh, the skill of making glass has not disappeared. Um, it has changed. There are more small studios and then educational institutes that teach glass design, for example, all the university, and then there are vocational schools in Nordajärvi and Ikalinen for glass blowing. So it is versatile and the skill is alive, but uh, the scale might have come down a bit. Uh, then I have a drawing there. Uh, when I was still a student in Aalto University, I did an internship at Nordajärvi factory, uh, which was like over 200 year old factory, but after that, they closed down too, so it was kind of a sad summer to be there. <laughs> so, we have spoken about glass, but do you know how we fabricate? How do we prepare a glass? Yeah, that's something we... Exactly, sand, exactly. So we can actually prepare glasses using different type of techniques or different techniques. So you can actually prepare from powder, like the sand, and we use the melting process. So, of so it's you use uh, so the furnace. So this is the furnace that we have at Tampere University, and we use a crucible. So this is to prepare our glasses for research. So it's uh, 50 grams. Uh, like what we usually do, of course, in companies, they are melting uh, kilograms, hundreds of kilograms, so the, the container is way bigger. And uh, so you melt, oops, sorry, you melt and then you quench. So the quenching is to go from high temperature to room temperature very quickly, so you can freeze the liquid in the solid state, and then you have the glass. And uh, so the powder could be the sand, as we spoke about, and the, s the, the sand is actually to make this uh, silica glass, uh, or the, the, the windows, or uh, this type of glass. But of course, as we, s we said, we can do different glasses, like the phosphate, borate, germanate, so they are made from phosphorus, boron, and germanium, so we can do glasses with different composition. And we have some other techniques. So we can also prepare glass from powder directly. So the idea here is to usually mill the powder extremely fast and at high, or at really high velocity in order to kind of like break down the um, atomic arrangement so that the atoms will actually kind of like separate and go into like some type of liquid state. Or more uh, what is shown on the, on the uh, right of the, of the image. Uh, we can also take the glass that we have prepared by fusion or by milling and get the powder and shape the glass. So then uh, what we're going to do in this case, for example, this is 3D printing. What we do is we mix the glass particles into a gel. Uh, in that case, it's pyronic, but it's, it looks like a gel, like honey. Uh, and then we introduce it into a syringe, and then we will print the shape that we want. Uh, in that case, it's a, it's a 3D scaffold, so it's a, it's a porous material which is used, used actually for uh, bone implant. And we can tailor the size and, and make like a really tailored di like dimension uh, material. Then we are going to do a sintering, where basically we are taking this gel containing the glass particles. We increase the temperature so that basically the gel will burn off. And then the glass particles will start to soften, stick together, and then uh, form the final shape uh, of the material. Then <coughs> something which is a bit less known is we can also make glass from a liquid. Uh, so this is the sol gel technique. So instead of uh, doing like the traditional way where we take like the sand and uh, the lime and all the basically the elements that we want in the glass and heat it up extremely at extremely high temperature, now we use chemistry. So in that case, what we do is we use metal uh, alkoxide. So we basically we make some precursor of the silicon, some precursor of the calcium, uh, sodium, or phosphorus. We mix them together. We control the acidity so that basically uh, the elements are going to break down and reassociate and repolymerize uh, into the, the silica network that we are uh, 
that we want. It will make some particles, and these particles will start to aggregate together. And then when we dry, they form the final product. So it's a glass made at to extremely low temperature. So this is extremely beneficial in some, uh, um, for some like, specific glass that cannot be really obtained because of the high temperature which is required. So when we speak about high temperature, we are speaking about 2,000 degrees C. So this is that high. <laughs> uh, as a uh, reminder, the oven in your kitchen goes to 250, 300. So this is super high temperature. Um, so uh, we can still do this high temperature glass, um, and we use gas. So. Uh, and this is to actually produce uh, the optical fiber and uh, to tr for um, a telecom application for internet, for example. So to do that, we need to have a very low uh, impurities in the glass. So for example, if we take the sand, the sand has a lot of impurities and we cannot make high quality glass, not has high enough for this optical fiber. So we need to use gas. So in this case, we use this gas here, so the silicon tetrachloride, and we are going to mix it with oxygen so we can make the glass. So the gas is going, the molecules are going to break down, and then the silicon is going to react with the, sil the oxygen to create this silica. And this is actually the techniques that we use, and, we, and then you can produce this um, high quality silica glass using really high temperature. So we, go we need to go up to uh, higher than 2000 degrees C to make this optical fiber. But uh, the takeaway message here, so we can do actually glass from the powder or solid, liquid and gas. So what about art? How do you do your glass? Well. My art pieces are mostly blown glass, but uh, if you think of like glass <coughs> art in broader sense, there's a variety of different techniques that you can use. Um, you can kind of cast the hot glass into a mold, uh, blowing of course, but then engraving, cutting glass, uh, making glass beads, stained glass, um, and then a bit similar that you talked about. Um, it for, for some reason, it actually has like a French name, pâte de verre, which means that you have like a glass powder that you uh, heat treat to kind of combine together to make a shape. Uh, but of course, glass blowing is probably the most striking one. It's interesting to watch and it's kind of, um, historic tradition that is still alive because most of the tools and techniques in glass blowing are quite ancient. I chose pictures of like Roman blown glass vessels and uh, they are quite similar shapes that are still made by glass blowers. So here's a, here's a clip from uh, this spring. Uh, it's a bit of a teamwork in the glass studio. So here is glass blower Jenny Sorsa and Samuli Parkinen and then I. And you can see that the glass is soft. We can manipulate it with tools and then the pipe is hollow. So when you blow, it will kind of expand the shape. And this is from Nuutajärvi Studios. Let me just say that actually you can visit New Tayavi and uh, you can also uh, take some um, few hours of class and try blowing uh, glasses. So if you are around Tampere and I think Fiska uh, close by here, uh, I think they still do that. It's really fun to do. So I really um, strongly encourage you to try if one day you have this opportunity. Sorry, Ella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's... Uh small studios they arrange this kind of practi practices because of course they want to people to get interested of glass making and get more visitors and uh Nuutajärvi, uh also Riihimäki um they are quite nice summer destinations uh then few words about the pieces i have here um i use this technique where um 
I kind of trapped between layers of glass, either engraving prints, sometimes um, painting uh, different colors. Um, crawl technique is kind of the exact name, but um, if I would somehow try to put it easily in words, my glass pieces are like onions. There's layer and then there's layer and there's images between the layers and this creates kind of a sense of depth and a bit surreal feeling to the pieces. Uh, I'm if, if the previous li slide, I'm just, th this shows the example. So uh, in my hand, I have like the first stage of this piece. It's engraved face, uh, actually using leaf copper as the coloring, and then it's reheated and there is like a new layer of glass uh, put on top of it. So there's kind of the first stage and then the final piece. So. and a detail of a glass piece when it's still hot and uh, attached to the blowing pipe. All right, so now let's discuss about the application. And um, so here are just a few examples that I thought you might be interested in. And the first one is actually the uh, Corning Gorilla Glass. And this is actually what you have on your phone when you drop it, that it doesn't break. Um, you know, this thin layer of glass, almost, <laughs> <laughs> yes, almost, they still need to improve. But actually, the research started in 2007. And this is what you can find on the Corning website about the history of this Gorilla Glass. And we are now at generation eight. And uh, so the glasses are very thin and they are uh, resistant to uh, the scratches and uh, breaking and uh, you can drop your, uh, your glass and they are still working on this. Um, if you look at the numbers, it's quite uh, impressive because they have more than 8 billion devices with this Gorilla Glass. And so you have it uh, not only on the smartphone, but also on the connected watch. And uh, thank God, because I keep hitting my watch all the time. So I'm happy that I have this Gorilla Glass. So at least now you know why your phone is getting better. They still need to improve. It's because then they should hire my son because he keeps breaking the phone. So phone exactly, phone tester, exactly, the kids. But um, so, but uh, they still work on this, and they are the new generation is coming, and uh, with uh, better and more resistant. Yes. So the other uh, application is photochromic glasses, and I see that some of the um, uh, participants they have glasses like me. So I don't know if you have your photochromic uh, glass. So it's glasses that actually uh, become dark when there is sun. So you don't need actually a second pair of glasses. Uh, for uh, sunglasses, and um, so it's uh, they have some very small crystal, and then with silver, the sun is coming, the silver is moving, and then becomes metallic, then it becomes dark, there is a cloud, and then it becomes transparent again, so, uh, or colorless. So this is the photochromic. Uh, now it has been um, developed to go faster and to 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 bleach faster. So there are still a lot of research on this topic here. Um, the glasses that Jonathan spoke about, so the Calcochene eyeglasses, you, you are probably not familiar with that. So they are black, completely black, but they are still glasses. So they are uh, not made with oxygen. So it's with sulfur, selenium, tellurium, so heavy elements. And um, because they don't have oxygen, they are black, but black in the visible, not in the infrared. So our body actually has it emits infrared light, and then we can see with that. So for example, this is used for uh, this night vision. So um, at, at first it was developed for military application, but now it's also for baby monitoring, so you don't need to turn on the light to see how the baby is sleeping. Uh, so it, um, um, the it's also used for the hunters, unfortunately, from my point of view. Uh, but um, 
the, the one of the first application were for the DVDs. So the, the first DVDs were actually from calcochinal glasses, and then now you have also pieces um, in uh, computers. But the main application was for the night vision. Uh, some cars, they have actually this night vision um, uh, option. So you can turn on this uh, during the winter when it's super dark, especially in Finland, and then you have also um, uh, the this type of vision so you can see if there is people in the street or on the road, so it's quite uh, uh, quite useful. Um, the uh, other application is fiber laser, and, um, and uh, so fibers is the size of your hair, and uh, this actually uh, has been one of the key uh, material for the technology that we have today. And um, the we had this uh, Nobel Prize in uh, 2009 uh, about uh, uh, the uh, optical fiber, and it was uh, uh, given to Charles uh, Cow for his work on this. And why I'm speaking about that is because of this fiber laser, we can actually cut metal plate so we go faster now to make cars because we use laser to cut. And uh, the cut is um, also um, clean, way more clean than with the saw. Uh, then you can do extremely precise cutting. Uh, you can also engrave, and this is what is used on the luxurious uh, product. So uh, it's really difficult to actually duplicate. And you can also clean with uh, the laser. So, for example, the, the building, you can remove the impurities and you don't uh, uh, damage uh, the stone, uh, as you can see here. So, uh, lasers have been a lot used, and uh, Jonathan will complete on the, of course, uh, also for biomedical application. Okay, so this is actually quite interesting because everybody knows about uh, fiber optics, for telecommunication. However, the first fiber optic developed by the Bell Lab in the US was not meant to be used for transport of data. It was actually meant to visualize. And the idea was someone, like a surgeon, discussed with, with a researcher at the Bell Lab saying that, okay, it would be so much easier if we could see the inside of the body of someone when we are trying to treat him. And that's when they decided to work on smaller filaments in order to make the endoscope that we, are, we have actually nowadays. So actually the first fiber was used for endoscopy. Uh, and then it developed into thinner material to transport light as uh, data. But nowadays <coughs> we have also developed a bit more, like with the development of the lasers and the development of the, the, the uh, photonic uh, in general, now we also have like fibers that are used, for example, when you have like an abnormal blood vessel into the eye, you can actually selectively um, remove this uh, uh, abnormal vessel uh, or basically clog it so that basically your eyes will not be impaired in the future. Uh, for those that regret to have like a, a, a tattoo, uh, you can also use lasers to actually remove tattoos. Um, but and nowadays what a lot of researchers are working on, so it's not really like district, descriptive here, is fiber sensors. So how can we try to Directly in the body, when we are doing, for example, like we are, when we are implanting like a, a medical device, can we detect if there is any bacteria? Can we detect which type of proteins are here? Can we detect the blood sugar, uh, the, yeah, the, the sugar in the blood, like the quantity? So basically using fibers and all the photonic and the, the uh, optics that we know nowadays, uh, can we use those really small fibers to actually probe some uh, physiological conditions? And this is something which is also still under research. <coughs> but something which um, is maybe closer to what I'm actually doing is there's a lot of glass and uh, glass ceramic, but mainly glass, that are used in the medical field. O aside from external use, like for example, this endoscope, do you have any idea how we use glass in the body? Did you know that we could use glass in the body? <coughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. And that was exactly the <laughs> comment from my mom. So when uh, the first time that I started to work with uh, glass for medical application, basically she was a bit like my son. She was like looking at the glass and she was like, are you going to retry to put that in a body? And I say like, 
well, not this one, but, but something close to that. So how do we use glass nowadays as a medical device? So first of all, like I said, glass is really versatile. So someone, with, and this someone is Larry Ench uh, in, the, in Florida, started to think like how can we make a material that will actually degrade in the body. So the idea was to take, for example, the window glass that we know and modify the composition. And what he did is he reduced completely the sand or as much as possible to maintain the glass and increase as much as possible the calcium and the sodium. And he put a little bit of phosphorus. Well, the idea is your bone is mainly calcium and phosphorus. It's hydroxyapatite. So the idea was to have like a glass that will actually degrade, release the calcium and the phosphorus, and force the body to reprecipitate hydroxyapatite, which is calcium and phosphorus. And that worked extremely well. That's actually the first discovery of a truly and amazing bioactive glass. So when he actually started to work on this one, he implanted the, um, the glass into uh, a rabbit. And then the surgeon, after a couple of months, well, took the, the bone of the rabbit and tried to remove the implant, as it's usually done to see like, the attachment uh, of the bio, biomedical device. And he called Larry Ange and said, OK, we have a problem. We tried to remove the implant, but we have never seen something like so strongly attached to the bone. I mean, we broke the bone everywhere, but not where there is the implant. So that was the, the discovery of the first truly bioactive glass. So where do we use that? Uh, <clears throat> and we can be proud. We have, so there is the, the first bioactive glass, which is 45S5, uh, which was done in the US. But we have the second one, which was done in Obo Academy uh, in Turku. <clears throat> and basically, those glasses aim at reconstructing bone. So we use them, like in this case, for example, like as scaffolds. So for example, if you have a bone tumor, which is like uh, removed, then we can fill the uh, large gap with this type of material. They will degrade over time and help in the reconstruction of the bone. Uh, it's also used, for example, like in uh, uh, women with osteoporosis, if a bone breaks and the ability of the bone, uh, or the, the regeneration of the bone is not sufficient, then we can put this type of implant. It will help in uh, regeneration. <clears throat> you can also brush your teeth with bioactive glasses. Believe it or not, I mean, please believe it. I'm saying it, so <clears throat> I'm not going to lie. Uh, there is a lot of work nowadays done on bioactive glasses in toothpaste. So the idea here is to have like extremely small particles of glass inside the toothpaste that will go in the tubules that are formed when you have like, um, hy like teeth hypersensitivity. And that will actually stop the hypersensitivity. So basically, you can help in the reconstruction of the enamel to some extent uh, and, and basically kind of like be pain free uh, uh, with this type of material. OK, well, this one is maybe <coughs> not the best, one, the nicest one to look at. But this was like a tremendous progress done uh, in the US by a company called uh, Mosai. This is one of the few, oh, not few, but it's one of the, this uh, um, strange glass composition. It's not silicate. It's not sand. It's actually borate. And those are nanofibers. It looks like cotton candy. Uh, and the idea here is to use boron. And like I said earlier, the glass is really versatile, so we can add ions that have like therapeutic interest. So in this case, boron helps in angiogenesis, so reconstruction of vasculature, which is important for, for example, skin. Let me say, nano <coughs> is, uh, will be what, 10, 10 times smaller than your hair. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's really, really small. And for example, this patient here, uh, she had like chronic diabetes, so chronic wound due to diabetes. They have tried everything in the market to try to kind of like help in the, uh, the tissue reconstruction or basically closing of the wounds, and nothing worked. So at the end, they tried new materials. They tried these nano, nano borate fibers that looks like cotton candy. And I think, uh, if I remember f well, within four months, the wound was completely closed. So that was like uh, a major breakthrough in terms of chronic wound due to diabetes. Uh, Mosa is doing well. We can, okay, so this one is uh, just an example, but this, we can also use glass as fibers, particles in composites, so in um, polymer matrices. For example, if we want to have like fully biodegradable uh, plates or screws, so for example, if you have a fracture and you need to put a plate, 
one of the downside of using the materials available nowadays is that they are usually metals, and it means that they will not degrade, which also means that you're going to have to go through a second surgery to remove the plate. So now a lot of researchers are developing uh, the, this uh, uh, biodegradable composite that contains bioactive materials to help the bone to reconstruct, and a polymer which is stiff and kind of like has some plasticity in order to be used for the plate or the screws. Okay, because some of the, the patients have like low ability to reconstruct or regenerate their tissue, we can also coat some of the titanium implants or metallic implants with the bioactive glass, and that will actually favor the reconstruction of the bone. Uh, this is of particular interest, for example, for dental implants. So uh, to make sure that the, the jaw bone will actually regrow against the, the implant and prevent any motion or micro motion of the, uh, of the dental implant. And finally, and this is actually the, the uh, product which is the most sold uh, uh, worldwide, is, well, the crowns. And basically those ones, despite their appearance, they're actually glass ceramics. So they are mainly glass with a lot of really small crystals inside. The advantage of using glass ceramics for crowns is one, uh, it has a really low thermal conduction, which means that as opposed to metals, like gold, for example, there is no transfer of heat uh, between your food and basically the gingiva. Uh, and you can basically tailor also the color. So uh, that's also why it, that's something that you can actually match the color of the implant to the color of your other teeth. So it doesn't kind of like uh, look too different. So from an aesthetic point of view, uh, this is really good. I'm sure you didn't know that we can use glass in all this application, and, and I hope at least you've learned something. <laughs> and now, what are we doing actually in terms of uh, development? So now we are working a lot actually with Leticia uh, on biophotonic. So basically merging the photonic and all the optics that we know with what we know about biomaterials. So developing biomaterials that will actually degrade, regenerate the tissue, and use the photonic compound for bioimaging. So either bioimaging to look at resorption of the implants in situ without having to do x-ray, which on the long run can be uh, problematic, or to look at how the, the uh, cells are behaving directly in vivo while the patient is alive, or to uh, release drugs. So one of the main issues we're going to have in the future is uh, um, basically like uh, resistant bacteria, that bacteria that are resistant to most of the drugs that are available. So now the idea is to kind of like release the drug directly at the implantation site. And light is an efficient tool. So basically we can send the light. If we send the light at the right wavelength, it can go through the tissue hit the material, the material will emit a light different, which is usually in the green, that will release the drug directly on the implantation site, and that will actually increase the efficiency of the drug molecules. So this is basically what we are doing at the moment. So no more side effect with the stomach or the liver, and then it's only light, which is safe. And, um, and we do hope that in a few years, we will have the first proof of concept of this um, in-situ drug delivery using light. When it, uh, when it comes to like future trends in glass art, it's, um, well, maybe there are some futuristic elements, but we're maybe coming back to the uh, more general uh, knowledge. So. When it comes to field of glass art, I think it's more and more that contemporary art is interested of the material, partly because it's very conceptual, it's transparent and kind of thought provo provoking. Uh, many of the modern glass makers mix different techniques in their work, so there can be ancient techniques and then some like really modern stuff also going and of course, when we have these um, empty factory buildings, uh, it's kind of a trend to restore them and have smaller studios and maybe art exhibitions and uh, new kind of activities um, 
in the old factory places. This is happening in Nuutajärvi and then uh, Riihimäki has mentioned there is like a really nice glass museum and then some small studios. And I chose as an example um, Kirsti Taiviola, uh, glass artist and designer, her work, um, an altarpiece for the church. Uh, they are like colored blown glass tubes placed on the window and the idea is that the natural light kind of brings the different colors alive. Uh, so use of natural light but also LED lights and I think neon tubes have been like a trend in contemporary art scene. Um, and also in Finland we have this initiative that when you're building um, building a new building in the whole budget you should put like one percent to art so hopefully it will increase that uh, you can see more and more art in pub public places and uh, then we are so soon to talking about one example in collaboration with glass art and science so So um, maybe Latice will, will start more on this, but this is the project that uh, we are currently working on. So actually we have uh, the first uh, project uh, funded by the Piakenma region uh, to um, combine science and art. And uh, so this is the name of our project. Uh, it's Photon Art. So it's when archaeology meets uh, contemporary glass art and advanced photonics. So uh, we got some um, archaeologic or Chinese glazed uh, from Germany. They were in the museum. And uh, so we could analyze them and understand uh, why they have this color and this texture. And then we tried to transfer this knowledge to the photonics and uh, application, but also for art. So for example, for photonics, what we found out, it's some of the pieces here, they have this silver uh, nanoparticles, so like the, the jewelry, but it's a very small uh, uh, size. So we try to make some laser glass with this uh, silver. So this is well known in the, in the photonic uh, field. And this is the latest glasses that we did uh, with different concentrations. So we went from 0% uh, percent of silver to 4 mole percent. And then we try to do some uh, um, heat treatment to try to change and try to do something else. And this is actually a paper that will be uh, published in July. So the, the, the study has progressed quite well. So actually this glass here is very, very promising uh, for uh, photonic application for sensing. So this is for the, the science part. And then artistically, of course, this Chinese glaze is so... Uh, we received some more small shards of these ceramics and they have this uh, glaze which which is a type of glass that is covering the pottery uh, so of course they are visually interesting so i try to take like visual inspiration from there but then we looked at the colors and um, tried to develop some new glass color recipes that are inspired by these chinese ceramics so i have now like a new color palette to work with uh, here on the shelf there are some small samples of the um, tests that we made and i'm currently working on making new glass pieces that will use these colors so these are um, these are the type of glass that i can use in glass blowing and creating my work and in the end of next year, I will be having an exhibition in Tampere of these new pieces. So um, you're welcome to follow, follow my website or social media. When I know more uh, of the timetable of the exhibition, I will, I will put an invite. So what we have tried to do, so these are the glasses that we actually made at Tampere University. 
and we try to create some unique color just for Ella. So she will be the only glass artist in the world with this color. So please, this will be an interesting uh, event. <laughs> All right. So, so here are some like uh, really early sketches. I, do, I don't have my new artworks there in the studio and very much in the making, but uh, I looked for the classical shapes that can be fine found in Chinese ceramics and they also the horse motif came from the Chinese ceramics. So it's simmering here and I'm slowly proceeding because the technique that I use is really slow. So. All right, so um, I hope now you understand the reason we named this session or this uh, Café Scientifique a welcome to the new age of glass because the takeaway message today is you have used glasses since this morning and even in your toothpaste and you don't even notice that. So let's celebrate the 2022 as the International Year of Glass. So thank you for coming today and uh, we are looking forward to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.